May the peace of Christ and the blessing of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It is a joy to come together and worship with you today, to be together in God's house as we come to hear the word, to commune with God in prayer, and to be with one another. We are at that point of the summer where I always feel a little tinge of bittersweet that it seems like it's going too fast. I'm sure many of you feel the same way. And one of the things that worship does is it gives us an opportunity to, if but for an hour or so, to slow down, to take time out of time, to ask that God frees us of our distractions and our to-do lists and our things left undone and our regrets and to simply be in God's presence and the presence of one another. And so I pray that that is what today is about as we end one week and begin another by focusing inwardly and outwardly on God's grace for us. I want to take this opportunity to especially welcome guests who are with us today. We are glad that you are here and hope that you feel a part of this community, whether you have been here once or your entire life. As you follow, as we complete worship today, we invite you all to stay for refreshments and uh, we offer those in the fellowship hall across the entryway with tables and chairs and uh, beverages as well as in our entryway if you'd like to do that as well. You might notice that we have a few extra visitors here this morning. Um, We'll hear more about that in just a moment or two. We're going to begin worship as we often do by singing, and I want to tell you something about this first song. So in every Methodist hymn book that has ever been published, the very first song has been, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, written by one of our co-founders, Charles Wesley. A few years ago, um, a wonderfully talented musician took the hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, and set the words to a a, a new and updated and lively tune. And so today we are going to sing a combination of both. We're going to begin with the familiar, which is the first song in our hymnal, although it's number 57, because apparently they had to put a bunch of other stuff before it. But it's still the first hymn. So in that red hardbound hymnal, it's the first song. And then we're going to sing three verses of the newer and updated version. And some of you had an opportunity to practice this last week. Uh, And then we'll close by coming back to the traditional verse as well. It's an example of how God speaks to us in a word that is timeless and yet also can reach new generations with timeless words spoken in new ways. So I invite us to stand as you are able in body and spirit. Let us sing together, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace, the triumphs of His grace. You've been practicing, very good. Let's sing to God's glory. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name, the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace, tis life and health and peace. For a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of 
Now, next week, I will have the slides correct, and you'll have the song correct, and we will look like we are an expert choir. <laughs> Praise be to God. You may be seated. Come, join the fellowship of God's people, people who gather as faithful disciples of Christ. We seek the one who frees us from uncertainty and doubt. Come, join the welcome of God's people, people who meet together for justice and peace. We seek the one who is trustworthy, the one who gives us what is good. Come, join the celebration of God's people, people of the one who was and is and shall ever be. We raise our voices in praise and honor to God and worship the one who is faithful. If you did not recognize the tune, which many of you, I suspect, did, you may have recognized that as a sung version of the Lord's Prayer. Probably the most well-known prayer in all of the Christian church. Because it was Jesus' response when people like you and I, who had been following Jesus and following him from place to place, or were in a place where he came to visit, <laughs> one of the first questions they had was, how should we pray? And his response came to be known what we call the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father or the prayer that Jesus taught. One of those light bulb moments when I was young in the church was when I would do something every week in church like say the Lord's Prayer as many churches have done every week and then I was introduced to the Bible and all of a sudden I found out that hey, hey that's where that Lord's Prayer came from. Yes, it is biblical scripture words, not made up by the church, but given to us by Jesus. So today, friends, as a gathered community, I invite us to hear from the Gospel of Luke. A reading today comes from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. 
He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? May the Lord add blessing to the hearing of this word. Thanks be to God. I would like to invite the young ones to come forward this morning and spend a moment with me here. Good morning, everyone. I'm trying to figure out who is sitting right behind Mila and her mom and next to Chloe and Al. Who is that? Why is there a lion in our church? For vacation Bible school? We're going to have lions at vacation Bible school? Really? What do I see on the door back there? It looks like somebody's peeking through our window. Who's peeking through our window? I see two giraffes, I think. Why do we have giraffes looking through our window in church? Do you see it, Linda? Do you think the giraffes are going to be at Vacation Bible School too, Chloe? Wow, that sounds pretty exciting. Because we don't usually have giraffes and lions in church, do we? No, we don't. So I think Vacation Bible School starts tonight. It's going to go all week. It is. It's a very exciting time uh, every year that we, we have a special time just for you all to, to come in the evening and have a little meal if we want and then, and then learn about God in all sorts of new ways. I wonder why we have a lion and a giraffe. I wonder why they're going to be a part of our vacation Bible school this year. I bet you I know somebody who knows. I bet you Miss Elizabeth knows. Miss Elizabeth, why do we have a lion and a giraffe at our vacation Bible school this year? Sometimes life is a little wild. I think that's true. Mila's very brave. She decided to pet the lion. And then <laughs> I'm like, is that a pretty cool lion, Mila? Mm-hmm. Is that pretty cool looking? We have safe lions and giraffes in our vacation Bible school. 
Well, one of the things that we learn when we go to vacation Bible school or we come to church or we go to Sunday school is we learn about how to pray. And you know, it's not just kids that have to learn how to pray. Adults would ask Jesus, how do we pray? And there's a lot of different ways to pray. There's not just one way to pray. And, and there's a lot of different times to pray. What's a good time to pray? At dinner? At bedtime? Good. Any other good times to pray that you can think about? Dinner time or going to bed? You know what Jesus would say? Jesus would say any time is a good time to pray. Sometimes we pray after something really good has happened, and that's a thanksgiving prayer. We say, thank you, God, for the wonderful day I had, or thank you for having my friends come over, or thank you that we had such a great vacation, or, or we pray after something happens to give God thanks. And sometimes we pray before something happens, and that's what we're going to do this morning. You know what we're going to pray for before something today? We're going to pray for Vacation Bible School before it happens. And we're going to ask that it goes well, and everybody has a good time and learns a lot, and we're going to pray for our teachers. So I'm going to say that prayer, and then I'm going to invite you to say amen with me at the end of the prayer, okay? And this is one of the kinds of prayers that we can pray together. So let's all pray. Dear God, we see something is, something's a little different this morning. We have lions and giraffes and, and birds seemingly looking through our windows, and that's because our vacation Bible school for children starts tonight. But God, we're coming to you before we begin in prayer, and we come to ask that everybody has a fun week and a safe week and that we learn a lot. We thank you, God, for each family that will be coming and taking part. We thank you for all of the children who are gathered up here this morning. God, help our teachers, Miss Elizabeth and the other staff members who will be and volunteers who will be leading our Vacation Bible School this week. Um, they've put in a lot of work, and they're going to do some more work. And thank you for our volunteers who will be cooking meals. God, we just ask that this would be an event that would honor you and would bless you and that we know you'll be here and we pray to, to be really wide awake and open to what you will do uh, in, in our midst this week. So God, bless us uh, and we give you all the thanks and praise. And now we're going to say amen and I'm going to ask you to help me in your out loud voice on the count of three. Can we do that? Maybe we can say it as loud as a lion roars. What do you think? Amen. One, two, three. Amen. That was pretty loud. All right. <laughs> Have a wonderful day and a wonderful morning. This is why I don't run vacation Bible school. I can't <laughs> handle the. There we go. Well, when we come to church on a Sunday, I often wonder. When you're leaving home or you're at home getting ready and, and uh, you're driving here or when you first sit down, I, I often wonder, what are, you, what, are you hoping, what are you hoping for when you come to church? What are, what are you looking for? What do you need when you come to worship? Or what do you want? Anybody willing to venture a response to that? When you come to church, what is it that you're looking forward to and hoping for? Encouragement? Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, giving a, a, a learning about a, a quality of life? Okay. Experiencing God's presence. Experiencing God's presence in our midst. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot because I can experience God's presence anywhere, right? So why do I have to come to church to do that? We are together. We are together for the 
purpose of worshiping God. So we can feel God's presence out mowing the lawn or uh, quietly in our home or living room or on vacation, but when we are here, the, 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 the primary reason, the sole reason we are here is to, to worship God, and we do it with, with one another. I, I, I sometimes will hear people who say, yeah, I really like going to that church because I really like the preacher. Well, I guess that's flattering. Um, I'm not saying they say that about this church. I'm just saying people say that about certain <laughs> churches. I've, I've heard this before. You know, and I think, well, that's really cool that you're supportive, but you know, it's, it's, it's more than that, right? It's not about the person or the personality. The spirit is present and it reaches people. And you know how I know that God works despite preachers is because people say after a particular Sunday, oh, I, I, that message was just, it was just exactly what I needed to hear. And then they will say something the preacher never uttered, right? <laughs> but somehow the, the spirit reached through, and, and I believe it's true, I really do. I believe that the spirit can speak through a song or, or, or a prayer or, or hopefully a message or, or hearing scripture read in a particular way. And sometimes, and we as preachers forget this, Sometimes God will speak through the silence. So we had a vision team that gathered here a couple of years ago, and, and we, we asked, you know, what's really important about what we do as a church? You know, why are we here? Why does the Milton United Methodist Church exist? If we weren't here, what would the community miss? And they, they named five things. Kathy was in that group, and, a, and we had a four-person group there, and we met... Um, for about a year and a half, and we're going to reconvene hopefully sometime in the near future. But what they came up with is that this is, this is what this church is about. It's a place where we hear and learn scripture. There's not a lot of places out there in the world that are dedicated to scripture, but the church is, right? We are a community gathered around scripture. Prayer. Not only is this a place where we come to pray, but hopefully it's a place where we learn how to pray. Connection. That could be the encouraging piece that Kathy mentioned. We come because we, we have a connection with other people. There's a lot of places we can get connected, right? We can get connected at our boat club, and we can get connected in our fantasy football draft, and we can get connected in our workplace and in all sorts of places. But there's a special connection of God's people that happens in church. Service. It's a place where we are reminded that God asks us to serve other people, and, and we get opportunities to do that, and grace. We experience the loving nature of God. And, and so uh, those are what we came to call as our touchstones. That is, is what we're about. Because we're not very much different than Jesus' original followers, are we? We, we? we really aren't. We have the same kind of questions, the same kind of yearnings. And just like Jesus' disciples, they were far from perfect. J Jesus called them and chose them from their particular setting in life so that he would serve them by learning about him. And so, perhaps on a day like this, Jesus was in their midst, and they asked the question, Lord, teach us how to pray. And isn't that the kind of question that, that we ourselves might have? I don't care if you've been in church every Sunday for the last 80 years. Do we not still find ourselves, Lord, Teach us how to pray. This is an interesting contradiction of what their question was. So, so they said, Lord, teach us how to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Now, John was John the Baptist. And, and, and if you know the Christian story, John preceded Jesus, and he was baptizing people in the River Jordan. And, and John would teach his disciples. There's a typographical error there. Just as John taught his disciples, his followers. But here's the contradiction. They address Jesus how? Lord. In, in addressing Jesus as Lord, they were acknowledging that he was unlike any other teacher they had ever had. He was the anointed one. He wasn't just another rabbi, just another teacher. He was God's anointed one who we would know as the Messiah, the Christ. And so in one breath, Lord, the one and only, God made flesh, Lord, teach us how to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. Well, you see, there's the contradiction. Jesus isn't going to teach us how to pray just like John, because John wasn't Lord. 
the best Bible study uh, convener or t- facilitator you've ever had is maybe a John, but it's not Jesus. The best preacher you have ever heard might be a John, but she's not Jesus. So when they say, Lord, teach us how to pray, they are going to the source. And so Jesus says what? Now, this is from the Gospel of Luke. This same moment in Jesus' life is also captured in the Gospel of Matthew. The words might be a little different. And depending on your translation of the Bible, which translation in English you have, some of these words might be different. You'll notice that the words aren't exactly the Lord's Prayer that we pray each Sunday in worship, right? That's because churches over the years have adapted it into a language that feels comfortable. One of the differences, of course, is that some churches say, forgive us our sins, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our debts. The translation here that we use has these words, Father, holy be your name, holy be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our I'm taking full responsibility here. I typed this up this morning. Is Brad here today? Did you have a proofreader? I, no, I didn't have a proofreader. That's what happens when you add the slide at 8 o'clock in the morning. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. That's the essence of the Lord's Prayer. Here's the thing. The form of this prayer isn't necessarily unique. Religious teachers at the time, when they taught prayers, they taught formulaic prayers. You know, a, a prayer that followed a formula that, that they could memorize. Why did they do that? Did they read? It wasn't a literate society. The only way to teach a prayer was by to, to, to teach it by rote and repetition, and they would eventually learn the prayer. That's what Jesus intended when he taught the prayer. But the fact that it was a formulaic prayer was not, was not unusual. You know, sometimes people will criticize uh, uh, something that we do every week in worship. Well, you know, we say the same prayer every week, and uh, eventually we just say the words, and, and, and they don't mean anything. Well, guess what? That's on us. It's not in the prayer. There is a gift to having a shared prayer that we all know. And if you never realize that, go to a, an assisted living or a nursing home sometime for people who can barely speak, and you go to a chapel service, and they will pray the Lord's Prayer. It is imbued in their spirit, in their essence. I fear sometimes that in our more modern expressions of worship, where it's good to hear things in a different way, that we are not developing a collective awareness of songs and hymns and prayers, and that when I'm in a nursing home someday, uh, we're not going to have this, this, this collective uh, sort of inborn prayer that is, is universal. So anyway, Jesus teaches this prayer, and and it's a model prayer. And we've come to know it as the Lord's Prayer or Jesus' Prayer or the prayer that Jesus taught. Some people think that this was an earlier version because it's shorter than the one that's in the Gospel of Matthew. Like I said, that's a little bit longer. You'll notice that the the words we say at the end of our Lord's Prayer came after the Bible. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's something the church added later. This may be one of the earliest versions of the prayer that Jesus taught. And, and what is Jesus saying here? You know the most remar- what do you think the most remarkable, unique word is in this entire prayer? Just take a guess. Forgive. Okay. That's a good, that's a, a good guess. Um, there probably would have been other notions of forgiveness, perhaps not in the way that Jesus would would come to teach that to us, but I'm looking for a different word. Hallowed, well, certainly proclaiming God as holy um, would have, have been a, a, a very important notion to God, to, uh, to Jesus, to remind us of that, but there would probably be a lot of Old Testament prayers that would talk about. How about Father? That's the word I was looking for. Why is that word in this prayer unique? Now, I'm going to tell you that in 20th and 21st century scholarship, there's a lot of conversation about the gender of God and is God male, um, and and that it's problematic for people who have had 
difficult earthly relationships with perhaps their own father. And, and I want to say, um, without getting into that controversy, that the gender is, is, is not, in my mind, what makes this word unique. It's the relationship. Jesus says in this prayer that when we pray, we should approach God like a child going to a parent. I'm sure you've heard this explained before, that the, the word father is translated from the word Abba, which, which is most closely related as, as daddy. There is an intimacy in the very first word of Jesus' prayer that sets it apart because he's changed the entire relationship of us to the one we're praying to into a relationship of intimacy and devotion. Now think about this for a minute. Jesus didn't say, well, when I pray, I say, Father, holy be your name. Because that would make sense for Jesus, right? We come to know Jesus as the Son of God. That would make sense. But then Jesus, if, if, if that's the only reason, then Jesus would say, so when you pray, you do it differently. No, Jesus doesn't say that. He says, when you pray, Pray like this, Father, hallowed be thy name, holy be thy name. What does that mean? It's not just Jesus who has the intimate relationship with God the Father because Jesus is the Son of God. He says, we have that intimate relationship with God. We cannot underestimate how remarkable this teaching is because it changes the whole nature of our relationship with God. How many of you have had a revered mentor or teacher or professor in your life? Somebody who taught you a great deal. I'm guessing a lot of you at some point have been blessed with a person who was a wonderful teacher. But I don't know, I'm gonna guess that although this person was a revered person in your life and may have even felt like family, the relationship was not as intimate as it may have been in what Jesus is suggesting here. changes the whole nature, not only of prayer, but of our relationship. This is a way of Jesus saying, when you think about God, you start your prayer thinking about God. The first word you do is you address the, the person, the, the, the God you're praying to. So think about who is God? How do you imagine God? If you imagine God, a far off, distant uh, gray-haired person with a cane sitting on a throne, and if that's the way you begin to think about God, Jesus is turning that upside down. And, and, and if the word Father isn't, isn't it, it, Jesus is talking about the nature of the relationship between us and God. Jesus essentially says, if, if God is like your father, your daddy, your beloved, then say, dear father. If you imagine God as a, as a shepherd, which would have been a common image of that day. Say, dear shepherd, if you imagine God like a mother or a friend, perhaps you start that way. But the essence is, the importance is to start by focusing on the relationship with God. You're only one word in to the Lord's Prayer, and look how much Jesus is packing into that one word. And it's essentially like saying, Father God, Mother God, you are wonderful. You are holy. You notice how the prayer begins by saying something about it? It's not about us at the beginning. We start with the relationship to God. And then Jesus says, what's the, what's the next thing you should pray for? Jesus says the next thing you pray for is for God to do God's work. Look at the prayer. Your kingdom come. That is, all that you envision in the world, God, may that happen. You're not asking for your own need here at this point, right? You're asking for God's desired kingdom to come about. We're praying for God to do God's work. It's not primarily about giving God a list of things you want. It's really about saying, God, you know so much more than we do. That's the hallowed part, right? The holy part. God, you know so much more than we do. You know how to make things right. Please do that. That's what this prayer is saying. And show us how to help. 
Because after all, if we really knew what was best, we wouldn't need God, would we? And to this point, I would imagine the disciples laughed. <laughs> and another thing Jesus says, another important thing is, ask God to forgive you. See, now, now the next thing that Jesus says is humility, right? Because no matter who we are, all of us do things, wittingly or not, that separate us from God and one another. But God is eager to have us start over again to forgive us. And this prayer roots our relationship to God in a relationship of forgiveness. And then Jesus says, oh, and by the way, when you pray, remind yourself that you have to forgive others too. Because it's really hard to have God forgive you when you're holding a grudge against someone else. Sometimes we have to forgive ourselves. And last of all, Jesus says in this prayer, ask God to keep you out of temptation. We all want to do our own thing. But God wants us to work together. Why do we need to work together? To help God's will be done on earth. So, ask God to help you in that. There was a story that was told during the Cold War. It, nobody knows if it's true or not, but it was a vivid explanation. And they were, the story goes that the communists were training the children of the Soviet Union to become atheists. So the way this legend goes, the story, if it was true or not, is that they would instruct children in school to pray to God to get candy. And of course, after the amen, no candy miraculously appeared on the children's desks. And then the children were told to pray to Lenin, the Soviet dictator. As you might guess, as soon as that prayer was done, the teacher put candy on their desks while their eyes were closed and their heads were bowed. And this was allegedly to prove the non-existence of God and the godlike qualities of Lenin. And of course, when this story was told, it aroused the indignity of Westerners every time it was told because it was a, man a manipulation and it was a cheap trick. And and Regardless of whether the story was based on a real event, the influence touched the lives in, of Christians in ways that the atheists didn't expect because Christians reacted against the presupposition of the whole setup because Christians had to admit that God is not some sort of celestial Santa Claus that exists to bring us toys and candy simply because we decide to put God to the test. See, that's not the nature of the prayer that Jesus would have taught us. But as I think about that now, unfortunately, maybe sometimes we ask too little of God. I suspect that most of us don't pray for candy. Although I have shared this story with you some years ago when we were visiting our daughter Jill and her husband Fong in central Illinois, and we were there over the 4th of July, and they had some very dear friends, and we were hosting a 4th of July party, and they actually allowed us old folks to go. It was a bunch of 30-somethings, and we went and hung out at the 4th of July party for a couple of hours. We had to leave and make our way back up to Milton, and as we did, uh, the, the good friend of, of, of Jill and Fong came running out of the house. It was the mom, and they had two little kids. She says, oh, she knew we were both pastors. She says, oh, Pastor Ann, Pastor Steve, I, could, I, could I give a prayer request to you? I've told the story before you. Some of you have heard it. I, I have a prayer request, and we thought maybe she was ill or she had her mother-in-law who was sick or whatever. She said, would you please pray? We have prayed for so long that we could get an in-ground swimming pool. <laughs> I don't know what facial expression came over in Anna my face. Um, we thank them for their beautiful home and said that perhaps someday we'll come back and you'll have a pool. I don't know. But <laughs> you know, I guess that's an okay thing to pray to God, you know? I mean, really everything is an okay thing to pray to God. God and you will work it out. 
the essence of the prayer is that God's gifts would be known in the world. And here's the thing. Sometimes we don't know what those gifts are, right? Because if we did, maybe we wouldn't need God's help. I wouldn't so much worry about what not to say in prayer. You can pray for a swimming pool. You can pray for a promotion. I believe that the essence of a relationship with God is that it's open and free and loving and grace-filled. And you and God, especially if you stay fervent in prayer, will work it out. You know, there's two really odd parables that follow this this preaching, and I haven't focused on them a whole lot, and, and I can tell you there's like 12 different sermons that could come out of this passage that Kathy read this morning. You're only getting one and a half, fortunately. But there's those two parables that Jesus tells. First is the strange one about showing up at somebody's house late at night at midnight, and, and the person's like tired, and they don't want to answer the door, and you're sitting there, and you need bread because you have friends coming over. It's kind of a strange story, isn't it? It wasn't a strange story to the original hearers. You know why? Hospitality was, was expected. It was commonplace. If somebody showed up at your house in the middle of the night, you would help them for whatever they needed. That was commonplace. Today it seems odd. You know, you're, you're, you're um, watching reruns of Grey's Anatomy at 9 o'clock on a Thursday night. You don't want somebody to come knocking at your door, and maybe you'll just like pretend that you're not home and, and people will go away. But that was not the expectation then. So this story to those hearers would have been strange. And, and, and there's a lot of, of, of difficult-to-digest pieces of that story that Jesus told. But essentially, it matches the second part of the parable that Jesus told, which was what? If you know enough to give your child good things and not bad things, if you, mortal human... Uh, limited as you are, uh, prone to make mistakes, if you can do good things, if you can finally drag yourself out of bed in the middle of the night to go help your neighbor or friend, if you can do that as human beings, what do you think God can do? What will God do when you knock on the door at 2 a.m. because you can't sleep and you have been woken with a persistent anxiety about something that you just can't make your peace with? What will you do when you are at your wit's end? What will God do when you take that prayer to God? Well, friends, if, you, if your best friend, as reluctantly as they are, finally will get out of bed, imagine what God will do. And if, if you know how to treat your children and your brothers and sisters, if you know how to do that in good ways, then imagine how much more God will respond to us. All of it in a few short words. One of the most controversial, something I said once at a previous church that got me in trouble probably more than anything is that I once said, I don't really care if there's a plaque with the Lord's Prayer in my courthouse. What matters to me is that the prayer is written in our heart. Because I think what matters to God is that prayer is written on our heart. Because if we live by this prayer, then we will naturally exude the kind of Christ-like qualities that the prayer asks for. And we don't need a reminder in bronze or granite. We will live it. The last word about this prayer is this. Pretty short prayer, isn't it? I close with these words from Henry Ward Beecher. He wrote this. He said, I used to think the Lord's Prayer was a short prayer, but as I live longer and see more of life, I begin to believe there's no such thing as just getting through this prayer. If a person in praying this prayer were to be stopped by every word until they had thoroughly prayed it, it would last them a lifetime. Let us pray.
Jesus prayed. And Jesus said, pray like this. God, we honor you on earth even more than we honored our own flesh and blood parents. Please come to rule our lives every day that we have on this earth. Help us to not worry about the future. We ask for enough bread to get through this day. Forgive us our sins, O oh God, but help us find a way to forgive every person who has done us wrong. And please, God, do not test our faith too much because we know that we are weak, but that you are strong. sing together. Lord, how then shall we pray? How shall we pray this day? What might you share? What God has placed on your heart to pray today? A prayer of help? A prayer of thanks? Or a prayer of why? Yes, Jerry. of Jerry's who suffered a leg amputation and prayer for his uh, healing in body as well as in spirit. Yes, Amanda. friend of Amanda's daughter who's suffering seizures and temporary paralysis, hospitalized at Children's Hospital Madison. And prayers as they wait for the illumination of knowledge of what's going on so that she might be healed and cured. Thank you. Alicia. Prayers for family uh, in difficult times of relationships and broken relationships and strained relationships that uh, God's will would be done and that grace and peace would be known to you and your entire family. Thank you. Yes, Jim. Mm. Sure. 
was a friend of Jim and Sherry who had a stroke and is not responding well at this time. Lord have mercy. Marilyn? prayed for Marilyn and Sherry as they went to Mission U last week, not expecting that power would be knocked out to Wisconsin Rapids for much of the week. Um, grateful that your hotel was able to accommodate you and hopefully that you had a wonderful and educational and inspiring week. Prayers to you and, and welcome back. Okay. Yeah, well, what camp, do you know what camp, kind of camp she's going to? Do you know what kind of camp it is that she's going to? Okay. So Anna, her, her granddaughter, um, Audrey, and, and Marty's daughter going to, to church camp at Lake Lucerne. And I cannot say enough about our United Methodist camps. I had the opportunity to be at Pine Lake this past Monday and Tuesday. Um, I, I led a seminar for all of our provisional clergy members, and we gather every summer on a retreat, and what a great place to gather. But... Um, when we meet it during the school year, we're the only ones there. And in the summer, of course, we're sharing space with all these kids at church camp. But to say we were eating in the cafeteria next to all these first, second, and third graders and uh, a lot of energy in that dining hall, let me tell you. <laughs> um, but it, it, our church, I cannot say enough. And uh, it would just thrill me to know that we had all sorts of families and grandparents and kids going to camp. And uh, it is really one of the treasures of our, of our church. So, uh, Sharon. I know some of you are, are uh, visible in your support because you come and you serve and you clean up and you welcome and you uh, greet folks and you deliver the food and serve it and everything. Um, but I know there are others who, who serve this ministry behind the scenes, uh, sometimes by your donations of food, sometimes by your monetary donations. Um, we are two plus years now and uh, the people who come and take part in this really value uh, this very much. So blessings to the entire Open Table team as well as the community and all the people who come um, to take part. Yes, Amanda. Darwin's granddaughter, Amanda, who's spending the weekends with Darwin and, and Joan, and Amanda's now um, assisting with his care and such, and uh, I know that's difficult uh, for you, uh, and uh, Darwin is having good days and bad days, and I visited him this week on a good day, um, but the cancer in his liver has been rather aggressive, and um, so praying for his ongoing care. Um, I'm going to take a personal liberty to take a teaching moment um, and we're actually going to spend a, a, a Sunday or sometime this fall talking about how we relate to people who, who are ill. Um, and I'm not saying this on Darwin's behalf. I speak from my personal experience, but I know there are times when Darwin would like to come to church. Um, and many of you have been in this kind of a place before. When, when you're coming back after an extended absence, either because you've been ill or you still are ill or you've gotten over something, sometimes people want to come back to church, but they don't have the energy for all the questions, and we're very well-meaning because when somebody comes back after an absence, we want to know how they're doing. Um, one of the beautiful things about a Christian community is you can come back to caring people, but sometimes I have heard many of you say also, it's hard to go back because I don't have the energy to talk about my spouse who died or my, my cancer diagnosis or whatever. 
And so I don't know what the right answer is, but I just share that prayerfully, and hopefully you hear this in a spirit that, that all of us um, um, can express our care by sometimes saying, it's really good to see you today, um, and not necessarily being one of 37 people who ask detailed questions, even though we want to know. And I, and I hope you hear that with the, with the care that I express it, because uh, I've done the same thing. Um, and sometimes people need to get away and come to worship and just be themselves and not be their cancer or be the widow or whatever. And I, and I know that many of you have been in that same position. And so um, does it make sense? I mean, am I speaking something that, and, and again, I, I want to be very sensitive uh, about that because we're all very well-meaning um, and, and caring about people. And we want to know. We want to know how they're doing. And there are times that may be more appropriate than that in others. But anyway, that's sort of an elongated sidebar. Um, um, but thank you for being present and sharing that care. Um, Jean, I think you had your hand up as well. Did you? And, and again, it's about being in community with one another, and, and, and I'll do the same thing, you know, I, and, and I realize that. So I, I appreciate that and, and, and how we relate to one another and actually being willing to share, you know, that kind of thing which you just shared and, and uh, because we do care and we want to know. Um, but there are a lot of us when we gather, and so perhaps sharing a prayer request. And I've had people come to me and say before worship, would you be willing to list this prayer request because I'm not in a place to either list it or – to respond that way, and I think that's, of course, we always respect people's confidentiality. Some people don't want to share things. They're more, they're, they're more private, and I absolutely respect that as well. So, no, thank you. It's all part of about being God's people and, and relating to one another in helpful ways, and um, I know when we went through Jill's illness, we experienced many of the same things, not in church per se, but she experienced those things. Every time she went out, somebody was asking her about how she was doing with her cancer and she just some days wanted to talk about the weather and be normal and talk about her kids and gymnastics and all that sort of thing so don't want to turn it into another sermon but um, we do indeed care for one another that's the connection we talked about earlier that's the encouragement and sometimes the encouragement is being seen and seeing and saying it's really great to see you today you're in my prayers Thank you also for your prayers for my mother-in-law, who is still with us. Um, we don't know how much longer that will be. It's been a long week of keeping vigil, um, but God will grace her with the time when it is time. So thank you for praying for Anne and myself. Um, let's, let's come to God in prayer, shall we? Our gracious God, we give you thanks for Jesus, who walked in our midst taught people like us, ordinary people who were chosen for an extraordinary life, to follow him, to incorporate his teachings into our lives with compassion and courage. God, I am so grateful for this worshiping community, for this congregation, for each person who found themselves here today. For whatever reason you brought us to this place today, God, may we leave having a greater sense of you, of what you desire for us, to get a glimpse of what your kingdom on earth might be. And God, we ask that you hear all the prayers that have been lifted aloud today, the prayers of wow for experiences that have so blessed us, prayers of gratitude for how others have helped us and we have had the opportunity to, to be with others. And, and prayers of help for ourselves and those in need of, of a special measure of comfort, encouragement, uh, direction, hope today. 
we are your people gathered in in all of uh, who we are the good the bad and everything in between and god we come to you holy and complete you are a holy god grant us your peace and we will give you always thanks and praise in jesus name amen friends let us continue our worship now by bringing before god an offering of our tithes and our gifts let us give generously for our good and the good of all Christ's church. before your altar this day we do so as an act of faith asking that you would grant us your wisdom to be your church that we would use these gifts not for our own ends but to help shine the light of your gospel into all the corners of our community and world in need of your grace your peace and your forgiveness and so it is O oh God that we come today to pray together in one voice Jesus' prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Speak ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be
you notice, to get ready for our vacation Bible school safari, we turned the air conditioner off for 20 minutes just so you had a sense of the African Sahara. <laughs> it's a reminder to pray for our children and workers this coming week. Today, dear friends, our worship for now has ended and our service begins anew. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.